Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Kathy Henrich. Kathy is the CEO of the Milwaukee Tech Hub, an organization focused on promoting tech companies in the tech ecosystem in Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Kathy. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I met you a couple of weeks ago through our mutual friend, uh, Nicole Donnell, and thought you were awesome and uh that's how, how we meet everyone on these things. So really, really excited to get into it. Yeah, the world gets smaller every day, doesn't it? Amen, sister. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I was kind of interested in your background because when I was doing my diligence on you, you're one of the few people I talked to that didn't kind of come up through like a technical path as much as an executive path. So I know you, you coded and, and you did tech and you're technically proficient, but you became a tech executive, it seemed like through an interesting uh, channel, we'll say. So what, what was your journey like? How, how, when did you know you wanted to do this and, and kind of what got you down that road? Yeah, I was laughing. I listened to one of your previous podcasts this morning and they were talking about childhood and knowing. And I'm like, well, that's not true at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> Who'd you listen so, to? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I forget, um, no but it was funny because um, I, I did just the opposite. In fact, um, you know, as a valedictorian in high school, I told a, 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 a counselor that I wasn't going to need math or science after high school. So therefore, <laughs> why take it in my senior year? And then in college, I tested out of math and science because I just had natural proficiency. And so I came into a tech career with literally um, high school, three years of high school math and science, which is very humorous. <laughs> nice. So, um, so yeah, I did not do the traditional path. I um, I went to school um, at University of Northern Iowa. I have a marketing degree after 13 different majors um, that I tried, um, <laughs> none of which were in tech. Um, but awesome. what happened is I was working for the dean of the School of Business. And um, as part of that, um, IBM came in and, um, you know, technology was different then. But as um, that company, I was so fascinated by what they did. And so I actually really wanted to work for IBM when I graduated. So much so that I um, was able to get the names of all of the managers in the upper Midwest. Um, at that time, I sent them all letters and resumes, et nice. cetera. I um, actually went, they didn't have a full-time position. I went to Omaha. I literally slept on the floor for three months, hoping that someday they would get a full-time hiring position. They did not. I left. I went and sold checks to banks, but then went to, um, I got a call three months later from IBM and um, asked me if I'd be interested. You know, you take a, at that time, IBM was willing to hire on a, on a competency test. Like, do you have the capability of learning tech? And with my lowly little uh, math and science background, somehow they accepted me and I spent 30 years at IBM. Cool. Um, what's interesting though is, and so it, it makes me into a person that truly believes anybody can learn uh, yeah. math or can learn tech. Um, you just sure. have to have a desire. You have to be curious, et cetera. Kind. But anybody <laughs> can learn this stuff. <laughs> a willingness, et cetera. Yeah. So I actually um, am partially self-trained, partially IBM trained, and partially mentored into having a tech career. So I... Um, I actually became a systems programmer in VM and VSC. I did billable work at one point in my career where I was literally upgrading um, operating systems, et cetera, which is very different back then. So when and was then, this, just so I can kind of place it historically, like decade-wise? And uh, decade-wise, very late 80s, okay, early cool. 90s, early we'll just 90s. just talked to a guy and, uh, like a few weeks ago who was an IBM like punch card 
entering guy and the programmer was a different person and he got into that route. Yeah. And it's funny, decade, like, yeah, you know, when you do Maybe these things, um, it was hard, right? I mean, I read, re I read what was read books at the time and just went deep. Um, and it was great. It was great for having the foundational experience that everything in tech is built upon. Um, but I have a very long career. I did, um, after that, I did sales, I did marketing, I did partnerships. Um, I led big businesses. I led half billion dollar businesses at IBM. Um, and then did a very crazy thing and took that tech career. And what, um, what was happening at IBM is we were implementing AI. And as we implemented AI to handle years. various, um, no, this would be in the um, 2018, 20, or okay. I guess 2016, 2016, yeah, 2017. Watson, I think. It was Watson and it was alerts that were coming into the system and we were implementing AI. And as we did that, we were basically firing people over here and hiring, trying to hire unicorns. And I just believed there was a better way. I believed we could take those individuals and upskill them. Um, and so I went back to school and got my master's in workforce and talent development, um, specifically focused on AI and automation and the changing nature of work. Um, and um, went back to IBM, helped them with um, kind of a future of work strategy, and from there went to Accenture and worked with companies as they went through digital transformation to bring their talent along. But along that journey, um, out came this opportunity to um, lead the Milwaukee Tech Hub Coalition. And as you mentioned, we're a nonprofit with the mission to inclusively grow tech here in the Milwaukee ecosystem. Sure. And, um, and, you know, I'm a big believer that tech is the future of any economy. And this is an opportunity to make huge change on scale. And um, so it's a fun place to be. That's awesome. So if I can go back a little bit just to IBM, I, I have a bunch of questions because, you know, a 30 year career at a company like IBM, you're the third person that I've interviewed in this podcast, uh, who's come up through IBM. But I don't think anybody that I've interviewed in this podcast has done 30 years there and also talked about how that was the place they had to be at. So, I mean, people love it, but I just, when you say it was the place you had to be, what, I guess, how did you view it when you were a student? Like, what was your, what was your window into IBM at that point? And then, yeah, probably go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, maybe my follow on is going to be, you know, did you start as a programmer or did you start somewhere else and then become a programmer and then go from there? And then I've got another yeah. one after that, but I'll wait. <laughs> so. <laughs> so first of all, the whole world of technology was completely foreign to me, but super interesting. Um, and so my exposure at that point in time was so limited, nor did I understand what was going to happen and that it would be a 30 year career. But it seemed like a place that um, would fuel my curiosity. I'm, <laughs> I am one that does tend to get um, bored quickly. And so it, um, it does, um, I thought that's where I thought I could go. And frankly, at the time, I don't even know that I knew there were any other tech companies at that, that point. So I, um, I went to IBM and I stayed there partially because of the exceptional people, um, partially because it was a culture that everyone did help you learn. And, awesome. you know, you were, it was invited to ask questions and to go deep and to learn what you wanted. And just that ability to continually grow while living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it was fabulous, right? Um, a fabulous career. So I had the opportunity to do, I was in the hardware business, the software business, the services business, the that solutions is. business, consulting. I did everything, right? And um, and that's one of the things that a company like IBM offers you is the ability to do many, many different things without ever leaving. Cool. That's, that's really awesome. So I can see why you stayed. And then it sounds like the reason you went there in the first place was just because it was like the biggest, most visible tech company to like a curious and you know, maybe difficult to attract, you know, kid at the time that wanted something awesome and to make an impact, it sounds like. Yeah, so that's, and that's I cool. found it to, to be exactly that. And to answer your other question, did I start in tech? No, I th actually started in sales. Interesting. And 
And, um, but within my first six months of training, I got, frankly, got scared because there was so much to learn about the breath. And I thought it would be better to go deep first um, and get very technical and then go into the breath of, um, so, you know, I'm a big believer in T-shape um, kinds of careers. There are times sure. in your career that you go deep into something and then there are times that you're broad based. And I just believed having a depth in technology yeah. allowed you to then go build and do a lot of different things. That's awesome. So for people listening, by the way, like I'm sure everybody knows this, but in case you don't, a T-shaped career is when you're really, really good at lots of different things. Or sorry, you're decent at lots of different things and you're really, really good at one thing. And that's like the vertical part of the T. So I'm, I, I don't know. I, most people probably know that, but just in case you didn't, that's what it is. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So you built out the um, the vertical part on on tech just by programming for a while. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Go. VMVSE, baby. What <laughs> is VMVSE? I don't know that one yet. Um, VM is um, so it's the predecessor to v uh, VMware on the mainframe. Cool. Um, so it's the virtualization software, and VSE would be akin to um, MVS, um, but for smaller systems. That's it. What is MVS? I'm just not as much. A, oh, a mainframe, mainframe, um, mainframe so virtual system. Mainframes operating systems. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. That's no problem. Awesome. Yeah, no, that, that sounds really fun. Okay. So now that you're in the Milwaukee tech hub and you've did, did you found it or did you come in kind of later on and, and take over? I am the first CEO. Um, so when I came in, I came in with literally a blank sheet of paper, but it was founded and funded by six initial founding companies. So um, including Northwestern Mutual and Advocate Aurora, Coles, Rockwell Automation. So some big names here in oh, um, the region. Yeah. So they were able to gain the initial funding for it and um, then sought a CEO to lead it. Um, but it was a relatively blank sheet of paper. Um, we had some research on things that had worked in other cities. Um, we had, um, you know, some, some view of what the strategies would be. But just like any other startup organization, you start with one hypothesis. And as you get into it, you learn and you continue to um, morph and refine what you're doing. So um, that's been that's been a phenomenal journey, both to do a startup from ground up, yeah. um, which, by the way, that's like any other startup. A startup nonprofit is no different. Um, <laughs> you know, you're worrying about everything from being, um, you know, the Microsoft administrator to defining your strategy and everything in between. And at the same time, the floor. Um, <laughs> yeah, you do everything <laughs> um, as we all do. But, yeah. Uh, and the other piece of it, though, is, um, you know, when you're refining the strategy, we came, we're now at a point where we say there's really four big things we do. Um, the first is really around attracting tech talent and tech companies here to the region. Um, the second one is around building a diverse tech talent pipeline all the way from kindergarten into reskilling and upskilling. Kindergarten? The third is... It's really young. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> The third is really growing. They're scaling the innovation ecosystem. And last but not least is really creating connections and community. And, you know, we have a hundred, we started with six members, now have a hundred, over 125 organizations all working together with us to advance that mission. Cool. So it almost sounds like just a coalition that you've been able to grow, um, if I'm understanding correctly, just to advance, you know, your region's tech scene, which is admirable and awesome and i think every region should be doing that because <laughs> that's the only way we get stronger as a nation and as a tech community so i mean that's good good on you for that <laughs> well and it's you're completely right um and i'm a firm believer that small nonprofits don't change the world it's just the reality right they make an impact but they can't change the world but if you get multiple organizations from the government and the universities and the corporations and the startups, et cetera, all kind of aligning and moving in the same direction, you actually can make a huge difference in an eco, you know, in an environment and scale much quicker. 
it's not easy, um, but sure. it is certainly um, it is certainly the right path to go if you want to make impact on scale. So, what do your members look to um, the Milwaukee Tech Hub for primarily? Is it networking with other members? Is it government funding externally? Is it recruiting? Um, is it none of the above and I'm missing the point entirely or is it all of the above? It's all of the above, Got which it. is always the fun part. And it's also um, helping create a talent, a diverse tech talent pipeline. So, so that's something the members are seeking out directly. That's not something that you've taken upon yourself to do external to like individual member requests. So we have... So you take and look for commonalities and trends and from there build offerings that help address that, whether we d deliver it as direct services or we partner with someone else to do so. So, for example, um, we actually saw, um, I'll, I'll take the startup ecosystem. So one of the gaps we saw in the startup ecosystem is just you know, we knew we did not have enough venture capital per capita that, you know, we should have. Yeah. And you can either say there either isn't enough money or you could look at the other side and say, we just don't have enough companies to invest in that are worthy of investment. And so we chose to focus on let's build companies and the money will flow. And so... We have an early stage incubator. We've had over 200 founders go through it in the last cool. three years. We've had um, over 100 and I think it's about 120 new um, businesses formed in the region as a result of that. This is a really early stage. That's a pretty strong success rate if you've done 200 and 120 of them have stuck around. I mean, the failure rate on product startups, I think, is 95% on average. So you've you've really beaten the odds or you're vetting your applicants really, really carefully or both. So that's, that's pretty actually, awesome. <laughs> well, actually it's just the, we are very inclusive. So the other thing that's probably, that's very unique about what we're doing um, compared to others is we have very low venture barriers to entry. Okay. We intend for you to come in as early as I have an idea of a problem I want to solve. Now and I think I can solve solve it through something technical. And um, the reason and part of that is we wanted to bring in founders from all walks of life. And one of the things that we've is probably one of the most successful parts of it is over 65 percent of those that have been through the program are from demographics that have been traditionally underrepresented in technology. So women, individuals of color, veterans um, and um, differently abled individuals. Cool. And so when you take a look at that, that says we're bringing in a whole new batch of founders into the ecosystem and really starting to um, build uh, build things at scale. That's great. Yeah, it's been very fun. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. So what kind of um, resources do you provide the companies that come through your incubator with? Is it financing? I'm sure there's mentorship. Um, I'm guessing you're hooking them up with the people you're trying to bring up through your reskilling programs, if I had to venture a guess. But uh, what am I missing? Um, what, I guess financing amounts, if you can discuss them, I'm curious. Yeah, so first of all, um, these as early stage companies, this is a community-based program with sure. community-based mentoring. About half of the program is instructional, about half of it is mentoring-based. Um, we are very fortunate that we've been able to give small grants. Um, we, they're $10,000 grants. It just helps people get started. Yeah. Um, and we've given out, um, we only do a subset. We do a competitive process with a panel of investors. Um, I, I'm a firm believer I should have no vote in this thing. I should take professionals' opinions. And um, and we've given out two hundred and forty thousand dollars of small grants um, in the community in the last couple of years. That's cool. So, so like twenty four of them. Yeah, twenty four of them. Nice. That's awesome. Yes. So it's been so that's been great. Um, so yes, continuing and continuing to provide supports um, and ongoing community to them as well, um, trying to connect them, whether yeah. it's to follow on funding or nice. whether that's, Just you know, that. talent or whatever that is. That's where do you look for follow on funding typically? So I, I can tell you a little bit about how Pittsburgh, like, are you familiar with an organization called innovation works here in Pittsburgh? 
I'm not, so actually. I, I think it's what's referred to as a Benjamin Franklin Center. Uh, although if I'm wrong on that, please send the hate mail to podcast.sta.solutions. <laughs> And um, basically, it's state funded, and um, they've got a bunch of subsidiary organizations that they use for different financing approaches. And again, I'm sure I'm getting stuff wrong. Uh, call me, you know, and we'll figure it out. But um, they've got one subsidiary in particular that I'm really interested in as a hardware specialist myself, which is called Alpha Lab Gear. So they had an Alpha Lab one, and they would give $25,000 each to selected uh, software companies, usually app development. So then Alpha Lab uh, Gear uh, was giving for a while um, $25,000 in exchange for 5% of the company, or I believe it was $50,000 in exchange for 9% of the company. And then I think they recently changed their model to a $100,000 investment in these early stage uh, pre-seed companies, but I don't know what their equity stake is anymore. So it's, it's interesting. And that's what I'm kind of benchmarking against in my head and where some of these questions are coming from. So I want to understand the Milwaukee version of this. And it sounds like that's what yeah. you come up with. And so, yeah, we have not yet gone into um, any kind of venture fa funding. We don't take any equity. All of ours is pure and non-dilutive funding. It's like a grant. It's a pure grant. Um, yeah. So we have not moved into that. Um, and I don't know that we will anytime soon. Um, there's other players in the ecosystem, angel investors, et cetera, that we that we work to connect um, companies up with, et cetera, as they work to scale. Um, so cool. but that's that's one element of what we do. Um, you know, we have done some corporate innovation programs like reverse pitch, et cetera. What's reverse um, pitch? It's basically when a corporation um, has a problem statement and they pitch it out to the entrepreneurial ecosystem for to get responses back that would allow them, um, you know, to take advantage of innovation, external innovation. It's so like a that's another. For quote. It's a little different in that the whole idea is not for the companies to own the IP, but rather to take advantage of a startup's innovation as a customer um, of that and allow that company to build a business where they own the IP. And, you know, you're just you're just becoming a client of them, but not like an RFP. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense in theory. Can you give me an example? I feel like it would just be interesting to kind of hear some of the. Oh, Anecdotally. That I, um, no worries. One of them, no, one of them was um, some of the data coming off manufacturing lines and how do you better um, align that, take a, ingest that data and be able to um, prepare that for um, analysis, et cetera. So those are, that was one, um, but there's been ones around like in healthcare around um, isolation um, and how do we help so solve you know, especially I, you know, seniors who are feeling isolated, and oh, this one was awesome. during the pandemic, right? Um, Everybody was feeling another isolated one, during the pandemic. <laughs> another one after the pandemic, um, and similar kind of thing is how do you build trust um, across health? Uh, you know, in your healthcare providers, and you know, especially for those that um, may have not had great access to healthcare in the past. Um, you know, and build that trusting relationship. So those are interesting problem statements yeah, that, sure. you know, one company doesn't have to own the answer for, but rather it's, a, it's an industry challenge or a market challenge that you could truly build a business off of. No worries. What's, I, I'm just trying to think like somewhat entrepreneurial myself, I'm wondering how I would build trust within healthcare systems as an external vendor. Like that just seems... Did, can you give any of the examples of stuff people pitched as, as a solution to that or oh, that one? I can't yeah, right like, away, yeah, but yeah, no worries. But there are, it's a tricky uh, there one. were always good ones. Um, yeah, it's, it's all of them have been very interesting. And then, you know, the corporations provide prize money, but also, I mean, the goal is to find ways to work with them and actually build a business relationship over time. That's awesome. And so you're, you're building a business relationship with a new company and a client or a customer, you know, which yeah. is awesome. And the customer is kind of soliciting the formation of these new companies to serve them, which is great. And then at the same time, I guess with the prize money and also awarding the grants that you are, you're validating these companies, which makes it easier for them to seek follow on comp funding. And right. know, also, I mean, 
I guess the sales to the customers validate them at the marketplace, you know, where the other one's an investor validation. And that makes them, you know, more people want to buy something if, you know, I don't know, Aurora Health has bought it already. And so just guessing, I don't know. <laughs> so. Yeah, so you're up, but you're exactly on the right concept. It's exactly right. So that's one of the things, I mean, that piece of it is one thing we do, obviously. Um, like we have an early talent exposure program on the building of diverse tech talent. We have a collegiate program focused on AI and data. Um, we actually have an apprenticeship model and also a network of reskilling providers, but in IT service desk, security, software development. Um, and then we also um, have, an, have been taking advantage of an AI upskilling program as well. So That's cool. Where are people... A, I'm sorry to me to cut you off again, Kathy. I've just got so many questions because you're bringing up so much cool stuff. Uh, if I can interject, um, where do the people that enter in the AI upskilling program typically come from? Like, I've seen people in coding boot, ca boot camps, right? The most interesting resume I ever read of somebody that came through a coding boot camp was uh, expertise in full animal butchery. <laughs> that was the beginning of the cover player, and then it was going into the stuff that they'd learned. So where, what are some of the backgrounds of people that come in to learn about AI, I guess, and what do you teach yeah. them first? So on the AI Academy, um, those are actually coming from within companies. They have to be sponsored by a company. So this is an upskilling existing um, employee. So, you know, it may be somebody coming out of an insurance company or out of a healthcare system, et cetera. Like a um, and admin? being able to... Um, I don't know that we've had any sysadmins. Most of ours have come from the business side of the house um, like and an are going into AI skill. I'm sorry? Like a director or like an engineering manager or an executive or a salesperson? They, they make a range. Um, they okay. can be any of those. Um, they just have to be able to um, pass some initial um, exams um, that like have IBM. competence. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Back to my IBM days. Nice. Um, but, you know, and to your point, though, like other of a reskilling program where people are new into the field. I mean, these are people that may have come from construction and no longer want to go up and down ladders, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, but or um, we have a re uh, one of our retail organizations here. Um, are using our help and upskill cashiers or people that have been in banking. So, you know, you really can come from a lot of different backgrounds and learn tech. And, I, you know, like we started this conversation, I'm a firm believer that people can learn this stuff and sure. credentials. I agree. You do not have to have a four-year degree in it, um, having agree. credentials work. A hundred percent, right? I mean, and I'm almost more impressed with the people that don't have the degree you would expect for a job that are doing well in it than the people that do, because that's someone that just figured it out the hard way, you know, and, and you know, knew they really wanted to do it and, and elected to do that thing. I don't know. I do think, I do think there is, um, you know, if you think about like imposter syndrome or whatever you want to call it, I do think people that come up through non-traditional oh, yeah. means sometimes have to battle that, um, I you know, that. but I have a master's degree, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I really do. And, and, you know, when I mentor people, I just say, just don't, I mean, ask the dumb questions, actually, believe it or not, many times you'll be surprised that they'll go, huh, I never thought of it that way because you have a different way that you, you think, and that's a good thing in, in tech. Yeah, for sure. It's an advantage. I mean, you know, if you have a perspective no one else has, you might figure out something that they didn't think of. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have to think of it not as a disadvantage, but actually in some cases it can work to your advantage. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned the, um, the imposter syndrome with people that come up through non-traditional means. So I actually was having a conversation earlier today. Um, and one of my colleagues called me and said that he's a um, technical program manager at Google. And there was another technical program manager at Google that he was working with. And his background was as an engineer and they've both done all this different stuff at different companies. And now it's where they're the other guy's background was as a technician and they both ended up at TPM. 
And the one guy um, that started engineering was like kind of like a little bit more analytical and like wanting to step back. And the TPM guy was really like boots on the ground, like, you know, like we need to get this done now, you know, and like, like a lot more, like, I guess, I don't know if I want to say tactical, because I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, he, he had a sense of urgency, you know, to his approach. So it was interesting to see kind of the different, different, and then scientists are a whole nother bag of hammers. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of Some of the best, the, some of the best formal. teams, yeah, some of the best teams are actually ones that are made up of all of those, right? Um, because you can overanalyze, you can be risky, right? By trial and error that sometimes doesn't work, right? And when you take the, the mix of skills, you actually oftentimes come up with the best solution. Yeah, I agree. Diversity <laughs> for the win. <laughs> Uh, no, we, we, we really like that on our teams too. So um, the company I work for, SKA, you know, we create teams of a bunch of different individuals to solve difficult engineering problems. And I find when you've got people with, you know, a more diverse set of backgrounds looking at the same problem in a brainstorm or, you know, at least, you know, in a, in a peer review session where you have, you know, maybe one engineer works on a thing and then hands it off to somebody else, the more different those people are, I, I think the better results you get because you have more perspective and, and a broader view and you're tapping into a greater base of knowledge. So I, I agree with you hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. It, it applies in so many elements, whether it is just innate um, personalities or whether it is, you know, if you look at strength based or even, you know, as you look at customer problems and solving customer problems, how you grew up and some of your experiences or, you know, even your current life, um, you know, that shapes a worldview that gives you a different perspective and has you ask different questions and that leads to the best solutions. Yeah. A hundred percent. So what's, what's some of the stuff, I guess, from earlier in your career that kind of helps you that some of your coworkers didn't think of was the aptitude test uh, piece, your idea, for instance, like, cause I just correlated that to the IBM I mean, I'm sure there's stuff like, I mean, you've worked at Accenture, you've worked at IBM, um, you've seen a lot of things. I'm sure that's given you perspective. <laughs> it, you it, is, it has in many, many, many different directions. So I definitely am more on the um, why, width of the T now than I am in the depth of the T. Um, you know, I think I think we're very fortunate oftentimes in our careers that various experiences come together um, to form a basis for what for what you do next. Um, somehow the universe has a way of doing that. Nice. So, for example, um, you know, I have a pretty odd combination of skills. I have deep technical. I can talk about AI and, you know, and I can go deep there. But I also have a talent development background, which is a pretty unique combination of things. And I, I think sometimes, and as I look at it, you know, for what we do now, those come that combination has been extremely helpful. Um, you know, and now I'm dabbling in venture capital and all kinds of other things because I have to learn that portion of the world as well. And so I think... Um, you know, every one of our experiences actually does build on itself. Like, you know, I don't know that there's a specific one that I'm like, oh, thank. Oh, I will actually say, well, there's one that I did that I would say, I'm really glad I did it. And at the time, it was one where it was actually a step backwards in my career from a title perspective. Um, and I went, um, I created a or did a startup between two. Um, large organizations um, around green buildings and smart cool. data centers. And um, A, I had literally no background in any of that. It forced you to learn very, very quickly. I remember within a month, I had to be in front of a room full. I, I had to speak at a conference um, to about 100 engineers, which, you know, nothing like imposter syndrome in front of 100 it engineers was talking more than about. An engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but you learn and you learn quickly, right? It works. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think that experience of starting a organization or starting a, 
a product from literally a press release. Um, you know, there weren't contracts between our organizations. There wasn't a product behind our oh, organizations, geez. et cetera. The balls of the it media was, person that released that. <laughs> it, it's a, it was a directionally correct. We knew where yeah. we were going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, and it is actually, you know, when you think about East Coast um, mentality of we're going to tell people what we're going to do and then we'll all go figure it out. It's a little bit different than the Midwestern mentality of we're going to excel and then we'll go tell people what we go, <laughs> just went and like that one did. Better. Yeah, <laughs> but they're diff they're just yeah. different approaches to the world. Yeah. Um, but I will say doing a startup um, you know, between two large companies that require partnership, et cetera those skills come in handy every single day. Yeah, that's awesome. What's what's an example of a time where you, you got to use that recently? Well, I Maybe mean, any of our, it, guess, like any stuff. of our member, like any of our memberships or any of our members, you just have to put yourself back into their shoes. What are they trying to accomplish? And, um, and I think that's one of the things you learn in partnerships, right? Is everybody has to have a win in a partnership, everybody, and you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes. No matter what you want them to go do, they're dealing with their own internal pressures. And, um, and so being able to do that um, comes in handy every single day in working with members, large corporate members. That's awesome. So you're almost like... <laughs> This is going to sound bad, but like a psychologist for a whole organization, you know, you're like a couples counselor, but for different companies. <laughs> well, you find out how do you create win-win, right? Yeah, and yeah, when sure. you can create a win-win, all, all, all will be fine. So Awesome. And sorry if that was like a weird analogy. I just thought no. trying to free associate here. <laughs> so, <laughs> So what do you what do you think is next? Like what are what are some of the things you see on the horizon? Obviously, uh, you seem to place credence in AI, which I mean, it's undeniable that that's going to I mean, has been changing, you know, a lot of um the technology sector and I mean, AI is an interesting field. What else do you think is up and coming in terms of specific technologies and then how do you think you're going to be able to attack those and develop them to the extent you can talk about it? No, I would say, I think, actually, I do think, I think um, generative AI is probably one of the biggest things that is going to change our industry and change it very quickly. And back when I was getting my master's, I volunteered in a kind of a grassroots initiative that we had, which was called Advancing AI Wisconsin. And we were basically going and trying to convince companies that this was something that was going to drastically change their businesses and also having that conversation at a government level, et cetera. I think with um, the advent of chat GPT, um, it has made it real for people. Oh, yeah. Um, 100 percent. You know, um, you know, you can I did a I did a letter of recommendation the other day and I just typed in, hey, write me a letter of recommendation <laughs> for this person. And, you know, like two or three things. And it was 85 percent done. I had to go tweak it, right, to have it be real and um, personal. But it saved me probably at least a half hour to 45 minutes. That's awesome. And I think, and I think when companies start to see just how transformative that can be on a personal productivity level, they can easily start to translate that into the impact it can have on their field. Now, I say that, and that is one small view of AI, right? Um, you know, between computer vision and all kinds of things that are going on. But I think it has, I definitely think our time has now come of uh, being people that, are, that people are able to understand potential use cases and see how that could drastically change their operations um, and therefore the need to invest in those kinds of things. You couple that with things like, excuse me, like quantum, sure. um, you know, and that's a much further out. But, you know, part of the reason AI is where it is today versus when the concept was originated 50 years ago, is just 
it's at a price point and, and we have the compute capacity now that, you know, we can do this at pennies, right? And which wasn't even possible um, at the time that Turing really, you know, came up with some of the concepts. Yeah. So you think about where we have come and then you add quantum and what that could do to this capability and that it will continue to be transformational, whether you're thinking about it in terms of, um, and, and I'm gonna say this in the best possible terms, any tool can be used for good or for e or for evil. Yeah. And we have seen that through the history of mankind. And so we all, those that are on the good side of the world, <laughs> we better all understand these technologies because the other side can happen too, right? And yeah. so quantum is a good example of that with security and, and those kinds of things. Um, so it is going to, it's going to accelerate here over the next couple of years. Um, I mean, obviously other technologies are, are going to continue to change as well. Um, robotics is rapidly changing. Um, you know, that is, a, <laughs> you know, so add the physical and digital world together, right? And that's what robotics is and um, things are things are changing ab absolutely so fast there too. It's been an interesting field to be involved in lately. It's definitely advancing rapidly. That's, that's one I know more about, but I agree. Yeah. I, I think with regard to AI, at least as, you know, a roboticist looking in on this other thing that, you know, people conflate robotics and AI, but they're not the same at all. And I'm glad that you drew that distinction. Um, you know, for a while, I think we're on that point of the garter hype curve where, you know, it's like the, what is it, the, the peak of inflated expectations and then the trough of disillusionment, I think we, we'd been in. And then ChatGPT, I think, put us on maybe that plateau of, okay, now let's come out with some useful stuff because... Obviously, this is real, and <laughs> you know it's going to be helpful. That's that's yeah. the layperson's view from where I'm sitting. You know, it's and it's going to be bumpy, right? Um, any technology implementation has, and I think we all just have to expect that it is going to. It's not going to be perfect, um, and and we're going to have to put guardrails around it. I think that's probably the biggest thing is that technology, and we saw this in social media, right, where when social media first came out, there was literally no guardrails on it. And gradually you've seen more guardrails come into that um, in order to protect, you know, against the the bad actors. But, um, and we're gonna see the same thing um, in some of these other technologies that are coming. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because ChatGPT even, I mean, will not let you ask it a lot of different queries. I know, because I've tried. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just think it's kind of I, funny to see like the level of sophistication and the guardrails increasing as, as they iterate their software. And so I've noticed that like a few weeks ago, I could get it to answer certain queries that now it will not answer. And you know, it's, it's just interesting to kind of keep testing it. That's interesting. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, I, I can't say that I've tested it on that way. Yeah. So. I was, I was like growing up, I mean, to get into my childhood, like I was always in trouble. I was always trying to see, and I was also a valedictorian in high school at multiple high schools. And like my parents had always had security systems when I was growing up and I would try to break into my parents' house, you know, just to see if I could circumvent the security system just because I was curious and I wanted to understand it, you know, in a different career, maybe I would have been like a penetration tester or something. Or... <laughs> you know, it, it is fascinating to me. Um, I think I think some of the best people in tech are those that are curious and willing to break rules and test and try and fail and come back and, and try it again, right? Um, so I absolutely agree with that mentality. That's, yeah, that's why it's surprised. I'm surprised you hadn't found the, the guardrails on ChatGPT because you strike <laughs> me as similarly minded in that regard. <laughs> time. <laughs> so, Fair. Yeah, yeah that awesome. makes a lot of sense. So the, the reason I guess when I've been using it is um, I have a friend of mine who's a, a research scientist and um, well, I guess I guess I have two friends who are married who are both research scientists and I'll hang out with them a decent amount. And I was friends with one of them and now I'm friends with both of them. And we'll, we'll go to their house and, you know, we'll sort of mess around with chat GPT like while we're drinking. So that's sort of a drinking game is, 
<laughs> trying to put things into chat GPT or Dolly. Uh, they just got an Astro. So we, we mess around with that now. I can try to see the limits of that. The Amazon, you know, home care robot. And I mean, it's, it's definitely fun. Like that's, they're kind of my intro into a lot of this stuff. Cause I'm not really monitoring the world of AI that much as a roboticist, but uh, these people, well, one of them is like a networks professor and that's different. But then the other one is a, um, like robotics research scientist. So their work straddles AI and robotics. So that's the bridge that that's like my gateway into it. <laughs> so. That's right. I mean, yeah. and, and that's just it. All these technologies are converging. They're essentially building blocks, right? And um, because of that, we're going to be able to, I think, move faster than ever before in history. So there is a lot of things to come. And and it probably couldn't come at a better time because we do have a lot of problems to solve too. So I'm into that. we have <laughs> it's never going away. We, <laughs> it's not going away, and we just have to utilize our tools to solve them. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you think? And I know we're getting close to time here, but I, I think we got time for a little bit more philosophy. Do you think that <laughs> the more we advance technology, do we create additional problems that, which we then solve with new technology? Or do you think those problems were always there? I, I realize this is kind of a bit nebulous. And if you want to just tell me that and say, I can't answer that question because it's stupid, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll just say, I don't know. Um, I, but I, there's no shortage of challenges, but I, the, the optimist in me says we are better positioned than ever oh, to sure, handle yeah. those shortage, those, yeah. uh, those um, challenges as well. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, obviously, I'm a tech professional, too. So I love this stuff. But, you know, I, I, I just sometimes it's, it's interesting because you think about, I think there's an anecdote that like in the early 1900s, somebody wanted to close the patent office because everything had already been invented. And, you know, I mean, every moment in history is the most technically log technologically advanced moment that's ever been. And so it's just, it's, you know, our imaginations, I don't think, can even conceive of what it, we're going to be like in 50 years or 100 years or, you know, even 10 years. I mean, as, you know, we can guess, we can say, you know, quantum's probably going to play a role, maybe. I, I don't know as much about that, but I believe you. <laughs> you know? We could say, you know, AI is almost certainly going to play a role. Robotics, I, I hope they play a role because otherwise I'm out of the job. And so, you know, it's, but, I mean, I really, I think the reality of what we're going to see emerge and, and how we're going to see those different sectors or I guess sub-disciplines employed, I mean, you know, who the heck knows? <laughs> it's kind of my, my perspective on it. I think one thing is for certain is um, because they could be so, because they're so transformational, our leaders, whether they're leaders in government, whether they're leaders in industry, et cetera, need to understand the technologies and the capabilities of them um, because it directly has an impact on our global competitiveness, our global security, all of those kinds of things. So um, the ability to make good decisions even internally, you know, as, uh, domestically, I would say. Yeah, I completely yeah, I mean, agree well, with you. And over my career, right, um, you know, tech was this thing in the corner, right, that, you know, some a crazy person that decided to become a systems programmer can go deal with to, you know, it's pervasive and it is truly our future. And so I think um, every <laughs> and our present, right. But our, every one of our leaders needs to really understand these capabilities. And I think you made a comment earlier when we were talking about our work about, do we go and advocate? Um, and we do partially because um, these the where we're going requires private public partnerships yeah. um, to get there. And um, so I think I think that is an important part of the work that all of us need to do is to be educating um, our our representatives, et cetera. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. How do you get <laughs> a senator or a congressperson? to enter into like an upskilling program to use your, your wording from earlier. Cause I mean, that's what it sounds like it has to be, right? Is, you know, you just have some kind of a literacy class and I mean, you ask, how do you convince them to do what you did at IBM and, and learn about tech? And I don't know, you need to learn at that level, right? But okay. what you do need to do is you need it's to understand literacy. the data. 
you need to understand the data, you need to understand the trends, and you need to understand the potential, and then you need to listen, right? Um, and take advantage of experts that do know the technology deep. I don't think we can expect everybody, you know, our leaders to understand the depth, but they do need to be able to lean on those and listen to those that do understand it well. Sure. How can I ask? Um, I mean, this is a tricky question, but like, I guess I'm just wondering because it's so far from my universe. Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you, do you just emphasize the importance and assume that they'll learn about it as a result of that emphasis or? Is it more like do you give like personal advice or mentorship? How do you how do you do that? I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, part of that's interpreting the helping people interpret the data and the trends um, and kind of laying out what that looks like. Um, you know, whether that's at a talent perspective, for example, I mean, I do something like there's all these headlines right now, right, of layoffs in tech, blah, blah, blah. And I've literally been asked, so does that mean the tech industry doesn't need people anymore? And I'm like, are you for, excuse my language, but are you kidding me, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and what I mean by that is the trends are such that we are going to need more and more and more tech talent. And these headlines are just temporary blips, right? And it's just a redistribution of where sure. that talent is going to be employed. And I think, so to going back to your question, it's on the us, on all of us that understand these things to simplify that and get people beyond the trend or get beyond the headlines and really do the data analysis that helps them understand the long-term trends, the implications, and, and then the resources that they can leverage in order to make good decisions going forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Cool. So. I think we're getting close to time. Um, I don't want to detain you because we both got dinners to get to. But, <laughs> yes, uh, we do. <laughs> um, is there a plug you want to leave or like something at the end that you want to just leave people with? Um, usually people talk about their company or, or something they're working on or something they want people to donate to or anything really. Yeah, I, I would just say I think I think we hit on some interesting topics that I think are important for everyone to think about. First of all, no one company can solve this alone. That's why organizations like or nonprofits like ours exist, because together we can solve those things, um, but alone we can't. Um, I think the second is just the criticality that tech is all going to play in all of our future. And as leaders, we need to understand those and we need to invest in those. And then I think it's another topic that we touched on that I think is near and dear, should be near and dear to all of our hearts is that because tech is our future, we need to grow inclusively and we need to grow that talent inclusively and we need people from all backgrounds to be included in this future that we're, that we're plotting forward. So I think those are, would be a way to summarize it. Great. And is there a website for the Milwaukee Tech Hub? I mean, I know everyone can Google it, but. Yeah, it's mketech.org. Mketech and then if you are interested in learning about Milwaukee as a tech hub, you can go to choose mketech.org. So mketech.org is That's just our, get. us as an organization, but choose mketech.org is one to learn about us as an ecosystem and how you can plug in. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. I really appreciate you coming on. And I will say, if you're listening and you've gotten this far, thank you. Uh, please consider subscribing to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. SKA Custom Robots and Machines. <laughs>